Eva, and I would like to welcome you to another episode of The Charm of It, a podcast for knitters who share my fascination with the nitty-gritty details of our crafts. <laughs> These are my co-hosts, Moth the Cat and Thistle the Dog, and they will like to join me in welcoming back all returning viewers. And to new viewers, hello! Thanks for giving me a try. You will find that I am a very detail-oriented kind of knitter who loves nothing more than chatting your he your ear off about project particulars. So if that's your cup of tea, you might enjoy this podcast. Returning viewers will notice that I am in a new space. That is because I mentioned last time I've been having some back problems and my back requires or prefers different furniture than it used to. I used to spend a lot of my relaxing time in my recliner, my giant lazy boy type recliner. But these days I spend a lot more time on my couch, which is what this is, or that little armchair, the striped chair that I sit in to record usually. So I decided to rearrange my apartment so that I would have the best views when I was on this furniture. It used to be the recliner had the best views. And as a consequence, <laughs> I need to record in a different place. The weirdly shrouded thing behind me is my computer. I had to throw the scarf over it because the light from the windows was reflecting. It's um, a Mac, so it's like silver, and it, it was shining. It gave me a halo, so that is why there's an awkward scarf thing going on. But hopefully this will work out i uh, i'm not directly across from the windows i'm at a little bit of an angle so do let me know if the shadows are too annoying and i will try to figure out something else to do but yeah so this is going to be one of my project snapshot episodes so i'll just be talking about my works in progress and it's kind of informal uh not a lot of no show notes i'll just include links to the projects on ravelry and that kind of thing. I am wearing my Selkie Second Skin cardigan, which I designed last year. I think I finished it at the end of March, so I'm just around the one year anniversary. And it is out of Elsa wool, which is 100% Cormo wool and spun, the sport weight, and I love it. This is my second sweater out of the yarn, and I'm planning to get another sweater quantity in the autumn. It's one of my very favorite yarns. And this is a very fun sweater to design. I can see that I put my cameo on a little off center with the dress. That's probably going to annoy me, but oh well. I tried. It's really difficult to center a brooch with a long horizontal stick pin. I have now been rambling for three minutes without talking about knitting, which is <sighs> unacceptable. So let's just go ahead and dive right into the projects. Nice thing about the couch is I can just put my basket right here. Unless Moth might get attacked by knitting here in a minute. We'll see. We'll put it on this side. Okay. So, I guess I'll just go in order. This is my tied up with string scarf. And it is out of, ooh, there we go, okay. Juniper Moon, Findley DK, which I will call sport weight. It's quite thin. It is 50% merino, 50% silk, and this is the garnet colorway. I hope this isn't going to be one of those days where I can't get the camera to focus. Anyway, and the pattern is by Isolde Teague. It is the Marin shawl. So as you can see, it's mainly garter stitch, and then it's got this lovely scallop detail with cables at the bottom. Is that gonna? Hurrah, we have focus. And it's completely reversible, which is really cool. The red is reading brighter on the screen than it is in real life. In real life, it's kind of a cranberry red, so it's as bright as I would go but it's not so bright that it overwhelms my complexion. Let's see if I start to put it on, if it tones it down a little. Okay. And this is my first time using this yarn. I chose it specifically for this project when I was home over Christmas. My local yarn store was having a really good 
sale on a lot of yarn that was like 50% off basically and I thought that all of the silk would make for a very nice drape um, since you know garter stitch tends to be bouncy so as you can tell I am towards the end I've got one more full scallop to go and then the little tip over here and this is the fourth ball of the yarn I have modified the pattern in the pattern there's a few more increases so it's a little wider and in the center she does short rows so that it's really deep here but I felt like this was more than deep enough and so I didn't see the point of doing the short rows for added depth I find this type of shawl easier to style let's see so so this way it'll be able to wrap around and I can kind of fold it over with the garter stitch if I want to and the ends can be like that if I want to wrap it once or anyway I'll play more with styling once it's a finished object and not on the needle since I've just managed to knock off several stitches but I'm knitting this on size fives I think and I wanted to mention this because I've been doing this more frequently lately so these are just six inch double pointed needles but I have some point protectors that my great-grandmother used and I have been using them to turn my double points into kind of mini straights and I have found that that is a very enjoyable way to knit flat projects that are um, narrow enough for that to work because when you're using circulars, I'm just picking up my stitches, to knit flat projects, you know, you have to deal with the cable and that can get a little tiresome. So I found that this was a really good solution and these things stay on. I mean, you can see I've squished it all up on my uh, needle. I used this same method to do my Rusalka cowl, which was even wider than this and I haven't had any problems so I'm actually thinking about trying to knit a sweater in pieces with the same method oh did I put a knot in my yarn I can fix that later and I have enjoyed this pattern but it's not my usual style because I cast it on when I wanted something simple because I knew it was garter stitch but the thing is that there's always something happening on this edging and it took me a while to realize that if I added an extra stitch marker then it became very simple so I had to look at the chart for a lot of it but just for the few stitches and then all of this was plain and usually I'm either doing something that doesn't require looking at a chart or something that's complicated all over so I'm not really sure how I feel about the half and half but um, I really love this finished project or not finished sorry I really love how the finished object is coming out and I think it'll be really fun to have a kind of bright red shawl scarf kind of thing I plan to wear it mainly like a cowl but we'll see so that is my first project I forgot to add that the project name is from my favorite things the sound of music song because I don't know something about this project especially when I was first working on it just made me so happy and that song just kept running through my head I love garter stitch um, I've really come to appreciate it even more lately so and I always love silk wool blends I'm hoping to finish that up really soon though I think I'll I think it'll be done within the next couple days okay so next up are the a pair of socks is a pair of socks and I am very close to being done with these two all I have left is the toe of the second sock so I plan to finish that today and get the ends woven in and get them washed and blocked so these are gift a gift for my friend it was her birthday and I love how they turned out aren't those seahorses incredible this is a free pattern on Ravelry it's by the sock pattern is by Yvette Hiver uh, Rose Hiver? Yvette Noel? oh dear it's the same woman who did the water for elephant socks and they're called hold your seahorses however she adapted a mitten pattern that is also free on Ravelry that's by a Norwegian designer whose name I can't recall I'm sorry I'm very bad with names 
and so this designer wanted to make a pair of mittens that incorporated traditional selbu style like the snowflakes and stuff into a more contemporary looking design and that is what i really really love about this chart is that there's the very typical knitting elements and then there's seahorses oh i love it so much luckily my friend loves it too I'm actually thinking I need a sweater in this with this pattern. Okay, so the yarn is Quince and Company Finch because it's my favorite sock yarn. And the dark color is Marsh and the light color is Honey. Honey is one of those colors that changes depending on the light. So in the day, it looks more yellow. In artificial light at night, it looks more green. It's kind of, it's a cool color. And my friend enjoys different a different color palette than me so it's always fun to knit for her because I get to do things like I would never wear this dark green color the marsh background but she is really pleased about it and as you can see there's a seahorse on each sock and then there's a seahorse on the back that's kind of hiding behind the heel flap and then the sole has this wave pattern that is also on the toe so uh, her patterns are always really well laid out. And then I did a regular heel flapping gusset with the pinstripe gusset, which she describes how to do. That's the same thing she recommends for the water for elephant socks, which I've knit twice, once for my mother and once for my the same friend. She's very knit worthy. So I'm knitting these on size two circular needles um, because that gets a good comfortable sock size for my friend. And it's really nice to not have to worry about the joins. You'll see my tension is way wonkier compared to my usual color work style. And that is because this is a challenging chart as far as floats go. You have quite a few long carries. I think that the effect is worth it because I like that there's more space, you know, and that these are staggered. They're not symmetrical. They're not supposed to be symmetrical. That's not me misreading the chart. That's how the chart is designed. And I think that the final effect is really nice, but it does mean that there are rows where you have to do a lot of catching your floats and it's a little annoying from that perspective. But as I said, it's completely worth it. And I know quite a few people when they knit stranded color work, they catch their floats every three or four stitches anyway. So if you're that kind of knitter, go for it. There are a lot of places where the same color is happening for six or seven stitches in a row. And if they weren't socks, I wouldn't even bother to catch floats with that because usually I only catch floats if the color is going longer than an inch. But because they're socks, I do go ahead and catch every fifth, maybe every fifth or sixth stitch is what I've been aiming for. But um, I did modify the pattern a bit. There's she does a, a striped cuff that looks really nice, but it didn't seem like it would function that well. I really wanted the elasticity of two by two ribbing. And then her heel flap is patterned. I was a little worried. I only bought one skein of the honey and they're 50 gram skeins. skeins. And then I saw that the pattern calls for 60 grams of the contrast yarn. So I decided not to do the patterning on the heel flap just in case because I didn't want to run out of yarn. And I'm glad I got to do the patterning on the toe. I'm definitely not going to run out of the honey at this point. Other modifications. I think that's all I did. It's a 74 stitch chart. So if I were going to knit these socks for myself, I would have to figure out how to remove quite a few stitches. I am one of those people who my color work tension is not tighter than my regular tension. So since I'm already a loose knitter, can't go down to needle size, I don't get tighter. So that's why I don't knit more color work socks for me. But I have friends who wear different shoe sizes, so that works out. And 74 stitches will make it really easy to adapt into a cardigan. That's what I decided to do. Sorry, I keep showing them too backwards. Oh, the other thing I did. So the charts are set up so that each seahorse, the way they face the front, they face the opposite on the back, and I'm not really sure why that is. Okay, I say that, but now I can see why it is. So when you're wearing them the way I did it, when they face together on the front, they're facing away on the back, which I had not realized was going to happen. So that must be why she did it. But at the time, 
I didn't understand why I would make the seahorses face the other way because then it would make me have to swipe my chart on every round, whereas if I did them the same way, I could just work that chart twice. I use my phone to read charts, I don't print them out, so having to move it seemed like a pain. But now you know, I don't think it's a bad thing that they're facing opposite. Um, but yeah, so I guess these are the seahorse friends and these are the seahorses who are not sure about each other yet. <laughs> I'm sure my friend won't mind. Um, so I really enjoyed the project. Her birthday was at the end of February and I did start the first one and I was down to about here on her birthday and I finished this one. So I was all set to give it to her just about, you know, close to her birthday, but then my back got so bad that I couldn't sit for several days. And I do pretty much all of my knitting while sitting, but I especially do stranded color work. I have to be sitting, like I can't do that laying in bed. So I had to put it on hold and then when I started being able to sit again, I really wanted to finish my sweaters in time for DC, so I put my friend's socks on the back burner. <laughs> but yeah, so I'm seeing her next week for my birthday, and they will be washed and blocked and ready to wear. And luckily we have a nice long winter and late spring. It's in the 40s today, which is what, around 5 Celsius. So she should still be able to wear them a few times before summer hits. I wish I could angle the camera so you could see Moth. She's being so cute, just purring away, sleeping in my lap. Uh, I got very lucky with her. Well, and I adopted her as an adult from a rescue group who fostered so that I could make sure that she would be a lap kitty because I like the pets that want to sit on me all day. <laughs> ah, Thistle's next to me on the couch. She's just out of frame. Okay. So I have two more projects to talk about. I suppose I will talk about the sweater project first. I'm sure you'll be shocked to learn that I am knitting another bottom-up cardigan in pieces. Uh, that seems to be my preferred method. However, I am knitting it out of worsted weight yarn this time, so I'm varying it up a little. And let me show you. So this is the pattern. It is called Twigs and Willows, and it is by Alana Dacos from Botanical Knits 1. And I am, okay, so there's the full shot. There's glare. Hopefully there's no glare. I am modifying it, which I'm sure you'll be shocked to hear about. And actually, this ties into the cherry blossom cardigan that you saw on my last episode. So I mentioned that I couldn't remember where I had first come across the cherry blossom cardigan. Now I realized that I was looking at this pattern, and I really loved the way she did the yoke, but I don't care for the fit of the sweater in the full body shot. So I wasn't going to do this pattern, but then I looked at projects. See, that's not how I like my sweaters to fit. So then I looked at the projects page on Ravelry and there was this one that had modified it so beautifully to make it into kind of a fitted sweater. I'm reaching for my phone. Uh, and it had a little bit of a peplum going on at the skirt and suddenly I thought, oh, I could, I could wear a sweater like that. And the knitter who would knit that sweater is the same woman who designed uh, the cherry blossom sweater. So I had added her to my Ravelry friends, and that's how I saw the cherry blossom sweater. Apparently, I feel like rambling today. Here is her cardigan. I hope you can see that. Obviously, I do not have her figure. My figure is less curvy, but I thought that I could modify it and end up with a nice little fitted jacket. Basically what I want is, since it's worsted weight, I don't plan to wear it as kind of an indoor cardigan so much as a little jacket for kind of transitional weather, so where you would wear a blazer. That is my goal with this cardigan. And I really love wearing little fitted blazers over my full skirts and A-line dresses in the transitional months. 
and I don't have a gray one so I thought that that would work out really well and I, I always love a peplum so I decided the pattern calls for five stitches to the inch and it's you it calls for one of the Brooklyn Tweed yarns the worst of weight one shelter and instead I am using Barocco Ultra Alpaca which is uh, less lofty than the Brooklyn Tweed but it's 50% alpaca so that'll make it warm and I decided to go ahead and go down a little bit so I'm knitting it at five and a half stitches to the inch just because since I plan to wear it as a jacket instead of an indoor cardigan I want it to be fairly windproof and I have knit three front pieces and I'm currently on the back so I will show you the back first and then we'll talk about the front pieces so as you can see I have a little bit of a peplum going on with the ribbing here I'm going to wait and see when I seam it up and wear it I might need to block that ribbing out a bit because of course ribbing draws in and this part is going to be the waist so that part is going to be stretched out so I do want to make sure that I have a little bit of a flare effect going on I don't want it to be as dramatic a peplum as on this cable cardigan I'm wearing but I want it to be a little bit and now I'm at the waist shaping and I'm increasing a third in on either seam and then right at the side seams as well which is how I usually do my waist shaping and so pretty much I'm just using the yoke pattern because I'm also the other major thing that I'm changing other than the fit in the plain stockinette portions is I'm lengthening the armhole because I consulted the schematic I fully firmly believe that you should be able to see the schematic of a pattern before you buy it on Ravelry as an individual download I just it really annoys me that you can't see a schematic because that's going to tell you how much modifying you're going to have to do and whether it's worth spending six dollars the reason why I have this book is because a couple years ago on Black Friday which is the day after Thanksgiving here in the US where a lot of books a lot of stores offer sales Barnes & Noble was offering a really good coupon code so I bought this online for I think ten dollars including shipping and since I really liked a lot of the accessory patterns too I thought that that was well worth it and this will be the third pattern that I've knit from this book and I can see myself knitting almost everything so that's why I have the book um, I really love her aesthetic even if I don't particularly love how her sweaters fit anyway here is the schematic for the sweater and I love how she does this I think the way she puts her books together is wonderful so I thought I'd show it to you and the smallest size is a 35 inch bust I have a 33 inch bust so I already knew I was gonna have to change things because I didn't want two inches of positive ease but what I noticed is that on the smallest size the arm hole depth is seven and a quarter inches that's really tight and you can see that in the full body shot okay so see how high up that's going and I can see how that would look good and not feel uncomfortable if you were going to wear it as a jumper without anything layered underneath it but for me if I want to be able to easily layer something underneath it I need an 8 inch armhole depth at least uh, just because that way I don't have to like bite and yeah I've noticed if a sweater is really tucked up in there it feels I don't know it feels like it doesn't fit even if it's not tight anywhere else so uh, I am modifying that that's a really easy modification to do on the body because you just start the armhole shaping earlier but it is going to make the sleeve cap shaping a little more difficult so hopefully since I've done quite a few of this type of sweater now I'll be able to manage it without too much fuss so on to discussing the three sweater fronts I've mentioned before that I seem to always need to re-knit do at least one major re-knitting session for each sweater and this is no exception and honestly I mean this sweater has flown by because the other sweaters I've been knitting lately have been at let's see the cherry blossoms was eight stitches per inch the lace weight was 11 the sugar plum cardigan was seven and a half 
the one before that was also seven and a half. So I've been used to knitting very fine weight gauges. So I actually knit this, this is the first front, up in a single evening. So having to pull it out or having to re-knit it wasn't that big a deal. So I knit it up and I blocked it and this was on size 5 needles and that's what I had done my swatching on and I've been trying to decide whether that was firm enough or not and once I blocked this I knew that I wanted something firmer. So I already knew I was going to re-knit it on size 4s and this is also blocked and I, I don't know if you'll be able to tell on video. But it's definitely just that extra bit of density that I think will be really nice for a jacket versus indoor wear. The other thing is obviously I really changed the ribbing. As you can see the ribbing goes much longer here and that is because I realized there wasn't enough of it on this, cart on this piece in order to have the effect I wanted uh, similar to that project that really inspired me. So I did a lot more depth here and I also changed the shaping. On this one I did shaping both on the side and where a princess seam would be, but I realized that what I really wanted with the peplum shape was for it to just flare out at the hips. I didn't need it to poof out in front of my belly. So I decided to move all of those decreases out to the side to get a more pronounced uh, flare there since it's two by two rib. So it's not going to flare as much as if it was a, you know, stockinette or something. And I also cast on almost an inch worth more stitches to start here. So that's the other reason why uh, this one is more dramatic than this one. And I think it looks much better. The other difference is not an intentional one. I realized that I had misread one of the stitches on the chart because the only difference between that chart symbol and another chart symbol is this tiny little diagonal line in one corner. And I had the book a little further from me when I was knitting the first front. So I just hadn't noticed it. So the leaves have slightly different stems in this one. So this is the way the chart is written and this is the way I read the chart. But I really love that detail. And yeah, so I really liked how this front turned out. And so I went ahead and knit up the other front. This one is not blocked. You can see why blocking is so nice. Well, maybe you can't see because I'm way back here. And I don't pin or anything when I block my sweaters. I just wash them and lay them flat to dry. So even without pinning, it looks much better. I also, the pattern calls for you to leave those stitches live, but I didn't like what my short rows looked like in the reverse stockinette. A little loose so I decided to just go ahead and bind off and I'll just mattress stitch them instead of doing a three needle bind off. Um, I know that Ellie of Skein Deer Knits was recently knitting a sweater where she had to do short rows in the sleeve cap in reverse stockinette and I know she experimented with a few types and found one that she liked but I couldn't remember which it was and I was feeling lazy and my phone was not within reach so I just did the bind off. I have, I think, about halfway through the bust increases on this back piece. Oh, sorry, Moth. I had to wind up a new skein of yarn, so I went ahead and did that. I've got five skeins of this, which is about 100 more yards than the pattern calls for. So we'll see whether I need to unravel that mistake front for the yarn or not. I'm making it a couple inches shorter as well as more fitted. Uh, the other major modification I'm going to make, and I didn't even realize this, you might have noticed that there are no photos of the back of the sweater. The, the patterning isn't on the back. It's just on the front. And it seems to me that if you're going to, like, I'm not sure, because obviously this is mirrored, so I don't know why you wouldn't put it on the back. So I am going to put it on the back. <laughs> obviously, in case that wasn't clear yet. So all I'm going to do is use both of these front side charts, and then the back has eight more stitches than the front does because she has a nice wide button band there. So I'll just figure out what to do in the middle. I'm sure I'll start with a 2x2 two two cable cross and then add an extra leaf right in the middle. 
and hopefully that will work because I mean people behind me should be able to enjoy the leaf cables too, right? Anything else about this sweater? I don't think so. I'm really enjoying being able to knit with my wooden needles instead of my metal ones, which since I knit most of my sweaters at fine gauges, I end up in my little metal interchangeables. And it's not that I dislike them, it's just I really love knitting with my wooden ones. So as I mentioned, I ended up, I'm on a size 4 for this. I'm knitting this Continental and I'm a loose Continental knitter, so size 4 needles are getting me 5.5 stitches to the inch. And yeah, I'm really looking forward. I didn't realize how quick worsted weight would go. So each of the sides, front pieces I knit in a day, it was the weekend. So I might actually be able to wear this before warm weather hits since, as I said, April tends to alternate between warm and then quite cold. We have a chance of snow in the next couple days. That will be fun. So pretty happy about that. Oh, speaking of temperamental spring weather, I can tell the clouds just carried over. So I'm going to go ahead and start a new shot. And my final work in progress is not something I'm currently working on, and I will explain more about that later, but it is the project I brought to DC on my trip. So my trip was eight days, including travel time, and I knew that I would mainly be sightseeing. So I decided a pair of vanilla knee-high socks would be more than enough for me to bring for the week, and I was right. So these are my mushroom hunting stockings. And the patterned yarn is Berger de France in the Gumi, and then it's the beige one. I can't remember what the, I know it's got something other than beige in it, but anyway. And this contrast is just leftover Knit Picks Hawthorne yarn that I had from a pair of brown socks that I knit myself. And as you can see, I haven't done the cuff yet. I'm going to do the cuff in Cascade Heritage Silk in a very similar brown color. I just thought the brown would go well with the pattern and really enhance the kind of foresty feel. And I was gifted this patterned yarn, so. I really enjoy using vanilla patterned yarn for knee-high socks because it keeps me going and it's just very relaxing and fun to knit. Even more fun if the camera wants to focus on it. Haha. -ha. So there's that Hawthorne in Fawn is the colorway, F-A-U-N, like the mythological creature, not the baby deer. I don't particularly like Hawthorne yarn, but since I had it, you know, it, it should be nice and sturdy for the toes and heels. I didn't use a pattern for this. I did try out a new toe. I tried out the Whirlwind Toe, which is recommended by So Sweet Violet, which is Jewel's podcast, and she is very sweet. And she was saying that this is her preferred toe, and I had never really found a toe-up toe that I loved. Wow, hopefully I can avoid saying toe 400 more times. And whenever she showed it, it was always really round, which is great because I have very round toes. <laughs> Hopefully you guys aren't keeping count. And so I tried it, and I didn't start this until I got to the airport, and it was simple enough that I could do it just right at the airport, and it was a really fun way to do the toe, and I really like the fit. I've tried this on, and it fits me really well. So thanks to Jules, I have finally found my perfect toe-up toe. <laughs> and then I did my usual toe-up heel, which is the same thing as a bottom cuff down sock heel flap. So you knit to basically where, where your ankle begins on your foot, so basically the highest point of your arch. And then you stop and you knit a heel flap back and forth, and you turn it just like you would a cuff down sock. And you pick up for the gusset stitches, and then as you're decreasing the gusset, that's forming what we would usually think of as the heel flap. So I love this because it fits the exact same way and it's made in the exact same way, which is my favorite way to do heels anyway. And so 
And the other ways of doing a gusset heel with a toe-up sock, you have to start doing increases. And I never start my increases in the right place. I, I either finish them too early and then I'm knitting with like too big of a sock trying to get to the heel. Or I start them too late and then I get to where I need to turn the heel and I don't have enough stitches yet. So this way it just takes all the guesswork out of it for me. And it makes the sock part go really fast because you're literally just knitting. I mean, well, I wear like a six and a half or seven shoe, so. But that's not a lot of sock to have to knit before doing the toe. And I continued the reinforcement up into the heel flap. Someone in the forum had asked me to go into a little more detail about this. And I figure since I do it the same way, regardless of which way I'm going, so I do a heel flap and turn the normal way. And here you can see I did eye of partridge here. But then I switch to just the regular slip stitch pattern, and that's because it's easier to read. So once I've turned my heel, I take stitch markers and I put them around the amount of stitches that I'm going to have when I finish the gusset decrease. So in this case, I was knitting at 56 stitches, so I would have 28, yes, at the, uh, on the back half. So counting out, you know, from the center of the heel, I marked those 28 stitches, and then the whole time I was doing the gusset decreases, I continued that slip stitch pattern along those 28 stitches and so then once I was finished with the gusset decreases I just switched to plain vanilla stockinette again and then when I was about six inches up I basically increased the needle size because I was traveling I didn't want to have to bring two sets of DPNs with me so I knit this part English style and then I switched to knitting continental because I'm a little bit looser as a continental knitter so that was the same for me so it's knit entirely on size ones. If I was knitting at home, I would have started on size zeros and then increased to size ones, but it both worked. And then right around here, I tried it on and realized I could do with a little more space for my calf. So I increased four stitches. Yeah, four stitches on just the back kind of space. And then I continue to knit straight up. And now I'm at the point where this one comes to right under my knee. I have short legs and so that's where I like to begin my ribbing because I like to do a nice big stretch of two by two ribbing and then if I wear the ribbing unfolded they come up over my knees so almost like thigh high stockings but if I wear it folded then I can make them the height the knee highs are so I finished that one on my trip and then I cast this one on at the airport on the way home and as you can see, I'm just about at the length of a normal sock. And um, the reason why I haven't worked on this is because a lot of my projects are plain knitting right now. And I prefer to have more complicated stuff. So I'm saving this for when things are complicated again. So these are two balls of yarn. And they're marked with the same dye lot. That does not look like the same dye lot to me, which is annoying. But I think that the overall impression when I'm wearing them will still be matching enough. Uh, but yeah, just something to be aware of when you're buying yarn from this company that apparently their idea of matching dye lots is not the same as mine. Okay, so as I alluded to, I have not planned my, my current lineup of works in progress terribly well. I'm going to start packing everything back in my basket while I talk. Usually I enjoy having at least three projects on the needle, sometimes four. And what I like is for one of them to be really simple and relaxing for when I don't want to have to think too hard. Um, and at least one of them to be very complicated and engaging. And then the second one to be fairly complicated, but maybe I don't need to stare at a chart but still something happening other than plain stockinette and instead I have managed to do you know this sweater is all stockinette until you get to the little yoke and then it's mainly reverse stockinette except for a very small amount of cabling and leafiness going on so I would classify that as simple in my mind then there is the shawl which, as I mentioned, is mainly garter, flat, 
with just ribbing along here and a cable every once in a while and then increases and decreases. So not something very intellectually stimulating. And then there's the Colorwork socks, which I have been enjoying very much, but since I'm knitting the second sock, I kind of already know what the charts are going to do. So basically, nothing is stimulating my brain right now. And I like to knit for a variety of reasons, but one of them is definitely for intellectual enjoyment. So I have plans. I've been casting on everything in my brain because apparently I need to distract myself from that. Sorry, more tea time. So my first plan is once I finish my friend's Colorwork socks, I am going to start another self-designed Fair Isle vest out of the Alice Darmore Hibberdian 2-play yarn that I received for my birthday last year. And I've still got a lot of it left over. So I was wearing the vest I knit last fall, my herbarium vest, the other day, and I realized it would be really fun to design another one. So I'm really looking forward to that, and that'll be another Colorwork thing. And then once I finish the shawl, I decided I'm going to cast on for a cabled cardigan. And I decided this last night, which is why it's really fun to have a stash. This is showing up as brighter than it is. It is definitely a very, um, I would call it a saturated raspberry color. Huh. Huh. Like the scarf. Look at that. <laughs> It's definitely the most saturated shade of pink that I can wear, but I can wear it. Whereas if it were as bright as it's looking right here, that would completely wash me out. So this is the color. Anyway, this is another purchase that I got at my former local yarn store down in Texas when I was home for Christmas. And it is Elsbeth Lavoid Silky Wool, and it was $5 a skein. So I picked up the five skeins that were left in this color, which is magenta which was like 25 bucks for a sweater's quantity. And that was about, I think, 960, 970 yards. And I thought I was gonna knit an Audrey and Unst with it. And I did pick up um, another skein in a gray for contrast, just in case I needed to do like button bands and stuff in a contrast. Although the Audrey and Unst only calls for 800 yards in my size, but that's with three quarter sleeves. Anyway. But then I was talking to Emily of Goldberry Artisans on Instagram last night. That's both her Instagram and her YouTube podcast name. So in case you are not familiar with her yet, she is very fun. And she had pulled out her epic cabled cardigan, or it might be a sweater. And it's the Woodcutter Cardigan, I, or the Woodcutter Sweater by Michelle Wang. And... I was admiring her photo and I realized that I have not done anything with cables this year. And so I was thinking about it and I remembered that another knitting friend had gifted me the, hopefully I'm going to pronounce this right, the Buddhasia cardigan named after the Celtic uh, warrior queen last year for my birthday. So uh, going to my history page on Ravelry. Do you know about the history page? Here, let me show you. So when you click on the patterns tab on Ravelry, if you scroll down below hot right now, there's this useful little thing that says patterns you've looked at recently. <sighs> patterns. And I love that because when you click on history page, it shows you everything that you've looked at, all the patterns. So if you had been browsing Ravelry and the pattern caught your eye, but you forgot to save it somewhere, Ravelry's got you covered. Okay, so. Now, I could have sworn her name was Budicea, but this is spelled, it looks more like Boudica. Like there's no E in it, so I maybe I'm wrong. But this is the back. Isn't that a lovely cabled braid? So it's not as complicated as what Emily is knitting, but I thought it would be fun. And I'm going to modify the front because 
this is the front. I don't want a button band that's this long and I want a more complicated cable. So I was going through my Twisted Stitch knitting uh, book, the one with all the different German, German, Austrian, Bavarian uh, <laughs> Twisted Stitch cables and I found one that would echo the back and fit in. Anyway, and it calls for, in my size, 900 yards of DK weight, but her DK is being knit at 24 stitches over 4 inches, so that's basically a sport weight yarn. And I have it! I'm deeply skeptical of how you could get a cabled cardigan with long sleeves out of 900 yards of yarn when the Audrey and Unst pattern is shorter, both sleeves and body, and just plain stockinette, and calls for 800 in my size, but luckily I plan to crop it anyway, so hopefully I can get it out of the pink, otherwise I can do the gray. Wow, I'm really unfocused today, I apologize, but yeah, so as soon as I finish the scarf, that's why I really want to finish the scarf so that I can cast this on, I wound up this skein today and I'm probably going to go ahead and do the gauge swatch so that that can wash and dry while I finish working on the scarf, and I'm really excited about that. You know, a lot of times we talk about the downsides of stash, but it is really nice to be able to just go to my kitchen cupboards. If you follow me on Instagram, you saw that my stash lives on the very top shelf of my kitchen cupboard because I'm too short to put anything heavy there. Um, so it was really nice to be able to just go and realize that I could start knitting this cable card again, like, whenever I wanted to. And this is my birthday month, and I'm the kind of person who feels like if it's my birthday month I should be able to do what I want so <laughs> I am just going to be indulging myself and knitting three garments at a time this month and then starting in May is when my summer gift knitting the season begins because quite a few of the people I love and knit for live in South Texas and so I and they're wool sensitive so I knit with plant-based fibers for them and I prefer to do that in the summer because who wants to knit with plant-based fibers when it's cold out? Wool is more fun to knit with, so, until it gets really hot. And with all of that rambling, you are now up to date on all of my works in progress as well as what I will be casting on, so a little sneak preview of hopefully what you will see on my next uh, progress snapshot in two weeks. So it has been wonderful talking with you. If you want to keep in touch with me, I am the charm of it on Ravelry and Instagram. And I would just like to say I'm so grateful for everyone's comments on my latest video. It really warmed my heart and made me excited to get back into podcasting. Bye!